the AFM of South Africa this year in 2016 is celebrating its 20th unity anniversary. I would like to say that it is fantastic that we are celebrating our 20th anniversary since our unity. We have been structurally united since 1996. It started, of course, beyond uh, 20 years ago. When the church became one in 1996, our desire was that we would have a greater impact in the entire society of South Africa, and of course, even beyond the borders of South Africa. The beginning of the Apostolic Faith Mission should be traced back to the place in Dorenfontein, the Little Hall, where the services started on the 25th of May. In that Little Hall, the services were characterized by the presence of the Holy Spirit and miracles. Many people who came received healing. Uh, but what was also significant about uh, Dorenfontein is that it was a place that uh, had all different kind of races. You had blacks, you had Chinese, you had whites living together. And in the same way, when AFM started, it was multiracial, it was multilingual. But what brought people together was the ministry uh, of John G. Lake, uh, which was uh, accompanied by supernatural uh, acts. Obviously, uh, the work grew and they moved from the little hall in Dorenfontein and uh, became part of uh, the bigger venue in Bree Street, which was used by a mixed uh, group. It belonged to the Zionist church. Later on, of course, then when that became small, they then moved to 73 Kirk Street, which eventually became the headquarters of the AFM. The AFM of SA was birthed in a context of racial tensions. It was clear from the beginning of its birth that it would contend with this issue. As early as uh, 1909, 1910, you could see the whole issue of racism manifesting itself. But it was not until 1944, when the Executive Council of the White Section took a decision of uh, forming three departments, which would cater for what was called daughter churches. These departments would cater for the blacks. At the time, they were known as the natives. So there was a native department. There was also a non-European or colored department as well as the Indian uh, department. In 1944, that is how then the structure of the church entrenched these racial divisions. As you can see, it was not only racial divisions, but you could see that the daughter churches were like uh, minors. They were not on equal footing uh, with the white church which was uh, the mother church. As far as the unity process of the AFM is concerned, one must look into what happened in 1974. Now, in 1974, the White Church's Executive Council took a decision uh, which had to do with the further development of the three daughter churches. Obviously, I must mention that at that time, uh, there was also a kind of uh, coming closer between the white church and the colored church. Because in 1976 already, uh, the colors were allowed to appoint their own district chairperson. In 1980, an important document was produced 
by a committee that was dealing with matters of doctrine, ethics, and liturgy. The committee was known as DEL. The title of the document was Unity Document. Its focus was on the constitution of the church. The document recommended that all racial references and connotations in the constitution of the church should be removed because division that is based on race is not supported by the scripture. That was the recommendation which was accepted by all. In 1985, to be precise, on the 2nd of August, all four sections of the AFM came together at Maranatha Park to discuss the future and the unity of the church. They came out with a document that was known as the Declaration of Intent. One of the things that were proposed by the Declaration of Intent was the formation of a body that would produce a constitution of unity that would unite all the four sections. And that committee for unity was then appointed in 1986, and it immediately began to work on a structure that would express the kind of unity that the Declaration of Intent envisaged. In 1988, the white section had to elect a new president. Dr. F.P. Mola had to retire. And in that year, Dr. Isaac Berger was elected as the new president of uh, the white section. Obviously, as he was not involved in the unity deliberations, uh, that started in 1985. There was a lot of orientation and the building of uh, uh, trust that had to take place. But I must state that uh, when uh, Isaac came into the picture, he was very passionate about uh, unity. He moved from district to district amongst the whites. Uh, allaying all the fears that were there, saying this would be the right thing to do. I remember, for an example, in the same year, 1988, we attended a Together 88 conference in Durban where Isaac also participated, and it was clear from then on that uh, the unity was on its path again. The unity trip was a difficult one, but the Lord was very good. And at one stage when we thought it wasn't working well, the three black churches decided they would go ahead in any way and unite. And then when we got united, we were called composite division because it brought the three divisions uh, together. The issue really at that point was we couldn't continue as an apartheid church. Our credibility was at stake. Our witness, wherever we had to go and preach the gospel, we had to explain first why we are divided in that way. And I think that's the reason why we moved that fast to form the composite division. There, was, there were also challenges about constitutions, technicalities, issues of property, and all those types of things. Uh, in Mafi Gang, one critical matter for me that happened is that at one stage we st stopped the process and said, does God want us to unite? And we said, yes, the Holy Spirit wants us to be united. We left the co Constitution, declared ourselves united, and said the Constitution will follow us. And indeed, the Constitution followed us. And for me, that was the extraordinary part of that unity. In 1996, on the 3rd of April, the two workers' council from the composite division and from the single division, which was white, came together at Maranatha Park in Lindest. The purpose was to accept the new constitution jointly 
as well as to elect the office bearers for the United AFM Church. I still remember very well, uh, we came from different uh, positions and uh, met at the stage that was to symbolize that the church is no longer two divisions, it is becoming one. Immediately thereafter, there was a proposal that the new constitution be accepted by the Joint Workers' Council. And it was accepted by the Joint Workers' Council overwhelmingly. Immediately thereafter, we went on to elect the new leaders for the United AFM. And uh, to the surprise of uh, many people, uh, Dr. Isaac Berger came in as the new president. And of course, uh, Pastor Frank Chikane came in as his deputy. I came in as the general secretary and Peter Tivet was elected general treasurer. We had agreed that uh, we would then assemble in the stadium, cricket stadium in Centurion to celebrate this unity. This happened on the Good Friday, on the 5th of April, 1996, where about 15,000 uh, people converged at the stadium and uh, the whole service was beamed through the national broadcaster. It was a precious moment for the AFM. The, the Centurion, as unity celebration service was an extraordinary service in 1996. We did what the world didn't believe a church could do, particularly the AFM with all the divisions that we had. The Lord was with us there as we celebrated the unity. And my brother Isaac Berger then was moved by the Spirit to make a confession which many people would not do. I confess that without us knowing that we actually sinned for many years, we sinned against the body of Jesus Christ by separating you and oftentimes handled you and conducted our work as if you were inferior mission objects. And I ask this morning, Frank, on behalf of those gone before and even those today, and I know it has been done in isolated cases in the past. I do it publicly today. I ask you to forgive us for all the pain that we caused you. And I was then put in a situation where I had to respond and the Lord led us uh, to this uh, uh, interaction and exchanges which became part of the history of the church. And I must say that was the most blessed moment in our lives. And there and after, we were on the road to unity and build the church, which has become one church. I would like to take this opportunity of saying thank you to uh, my brother, Pastor Bergel, for what he has done today. The many people who have been looking forward to this happening in our midst. That the unity we have come to is true unity. Hallelujah. And I would like to assure you this day that we have forgiven one another. May God bless you and be with you. And I want to thank our brothers and sisters who have now come together with us so that we do not ever sin against one another Amen. again. From now on, we're going to walk together Amen. and learn to do it together Amen. and be ambassadors of the Lord in this world. May God bless you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. In, in 1999, we appeared before the Truth Commission like all other uh, churches did. And this was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. 
And our story as the AFM became an extraordinary story. Many churches talked about divisions and challenges they were facing, the struggle for unity. And there we were arriving there, uh, telling the story that God did within the, the AFM. And it touched a lot of the people who were in the Truth Commission, particularly the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Now that uh, the AFM is positioned for the future in terms of uh, its structure and in terms of its goal. May every member of the AFM accept a calling of being a sent one as the salt and the light of the earth. May every AFM member become a missionary and may all of our pastors become equipped coaches to advance the kingdom of God. Wherever you find people, you will find AFM. <music>